Last year, Allie Truitt was on vacation snorkeling when a shark attacked her and her friend. Allie was left without part of one of her legs, but that didn't stop Allie from doing what she loves. The former Yale University swimmer will be competing for Team USA in this year's Paralympic Games in Paris. This is Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're preparing for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Later in the show, we'll hear from a breaker for Team USA. This summer marks the debut of breaking as an Olympic sport. Breaking is often called break dancing in the media. We'll also learn about some of the geopolitics surrounding this year's Olympics, including the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine. But first, Allie Truitt is a Paralympic swimmer from Connecticut. Allie, welcome to Disrupted. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. You know, we're excited to talk with you because it takes so much focus and strength to get to the level of being a Paralympic athlete. But before we talk about this summer's games, I'm curious, what drew you to swimming? I actually started swimming at a really young age. I have three brothers and we're all within three years of age. And so my mom threw us in swim lessons really young just for water safety. And I immediately fell in love with the water. I love that it was this place I could be with my friends and also simultaneously push myself physically and emotionally. So you clearly are at home in the water. I wonder what it feels like when you're swimming, when you're in this space where you feel so connected and at the same time you're competing. What does swimming feel like for you? Yeah, swimming feels like a lot for me. And especially in this past year, I've worked to get back to that place of feeling peaceful and happy in the water post shark attack. Um, But for me, I love the freedom I feel in the water. And I love that it's this place where my mind is just focused on the present of where I am and kind of forgets about everything else going on around me. And you're right, it is this really cool switch of when it's time to compete, you forget about, you know, the freedom and the peace in the water instead focus on pushing yourself as much as you can and using it as a vehicle to help you show yourself what you're capable of. You've used the words freedom and peace several times in talking about being in the water and what swimming means to you. You also mentioned that just a year ago, that sense of peace was really disrupted by this attack. Share with our listeners that experience and how you were able to push through to find peace and comfort in the water again. Yes. So uh, just over a year ago, I was snorkeling with one of my best friends um, on vacation and a shark came up out of nowhere and started attacking us. And we fought back, but it ultimately bit my foot and part of my leg off during the attack. And we screamed for help, but no help came. And so we made the split second decision to swim for our lives, roughly 75 yards in the open ocean water, Um, me bleeding profusely still. And, uh, you know, both of us knowing a shark was still circling to get back to the boat to save ourselves. And so returning to the water after that, I was really fearful. Uh, The last time I had heard the sound of water at that point, you know, I was swimming for my life. And so I was scared to get back in. But for me, I felt like I've lost a lot through the attack. And some of what I've lost, I'm never going to get back. You know, I'm never getting my foot back. So the things that I could fight to get back, I decided I was going to fight to get back. And so I worked to get back in the water. It started with my backyard pool. Um, And I'm really lucky my mom's a therapist. So she helped so much with just some of those mental fears I was having, getting back in and experiencing flashbacks to the attack. Um, And from there, it sort of expanded. I got back into training with my coach who's coached me since I was 12 years old. And you know, it was definitely very up and down. There were those days where I didn't have that peace and that comfort, but I knew that it was within reach. And the more I showed myself I could, the more I found that peace and comfort again. The other thing it sounds like, Ali, you reclaimed your power, that power to say, yes, this tragic thing happened, but I'm going to try even if it has fits and starts and there are challenges. And as I'm listening to you talk about that challenge of getting back into the water, the memories that it brought up, I'm also reminded that there's so many conversations happening right now about mental health and well-being for athletes and the ways in which we as spectators 
sometimes create unrealistic expectations or pressures that don't recognize people as people. How important has that been for you during your healing journey to be able to say, maybe I'm not okay today, but I deserve to feel and deal the way that I need to? Yes. Uh, I love that you just phrased that because it's true. I've really learned that through this journey, um, you know, the power of vulnerability. And I think in sport, it's something that's continuing to be focused on more and definitely has room for improvement to be focused on more. But as a lifelong athlete, I grew up um, in sport, not feeling like being vulnerable was necessarily the natural option. We're taught to push through when we feel sore and tired. And so, um, you know, this year has definitely been a big learning year for me in terms of learning how to balance giving myself grace on those hard days with also pushing myself on the days that I'm capable of, of doing so. And I actually call it a grace and gratitude mindset. And so I focus a lot on all that I do have and what I'm grateful for, you know, physically in my own body and also in terms of all of the support I have around me. And I also have grace for myself on those hard days where, you know, it might just feel like too much or I need a break. And again, I'm also really lucky because my coach is actually in school to become a therapist as well. And so he is kind of that perfect blend of, you know, helping me recognize the days that we need to hit the pause button and kind of sit and feel the feels and then pushing me on the days that that's where we're at and I'm capable of, of going. Your journey in terms of, of rebounding from this attack been a little over a year and you are already set to compete in the Paralympic Games. How did you make the decision or when did you make the decision? I'm going to keep competing and this is the way that I'm going to do it. Um, yes, it's definitely a quick turnaround. And I knew that trying to make the team was, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat a little bit. And I'm really, really proud of myself for how far I've come in a year. I truthfully, you know, it initially started, like I said, in my backyard pool, I wanted to reclaim my love of the water. And that was important to me. And from there, I was actually missing cardio a lot. Uh, I think for me, exercise and sports feel like a really tangible way to help us all feel stronger again. And so I got back into the pool because at that point, you know, I was still getting fit for a prosthetic and recovering um, in terms of healing in my leg. And so I couldn't run. I couldn't walk. Um, or was still learning to do all that again. And the pool was a space for me that I didn't need my leg. And so I called my coach who's coached me since I was 12 years old, Jamie Barone. And he came to the pool and we started doing workouts just to make me feel strong and happy and, you know, get some exercise in. And I think that was sort of where it started kind of the idea started permeating for me of what if, what if I could do this? What if in a year I could see myself at the Paralympics in Paris? And um, I feel like a lot of times, me personally, but generally maybe a lot of people go with what if, and then it's a fear or a negative thing. And it was one of the first times for me where I had a what if that was a really positive and exciting ending. And so that landed me about three and a half months out from the shark attack and the amputation at my first Paralympic meet. Um, I remember I showed up and I didn't even know how to get on the blocks on one leg. I had been back training for like a few days and I gave myself until nationals in December, which was six months out from the amputation and the attack to make my decision. And I remember just feeling so welcomed into the community uh, on deck and so just in awe of what these athletes are able to do. And I felt like that was a place that I wanted to be where, um, you know, I was able to focus on what I still could do instead of what I couldn't. I imagine that that mindset carries you through the challenging moments, but also allows you to embrace the beauty of what you are set to do, and that is to compete in the Paralympic Games. What does this moment mean for you? What, it, what does it feel like for you as you think about what you are embarking on now? Oh my gosh, competing in the Paralympic Games means the world to me. Having been a lifelong athlete, you know, we all dream of achieving that next higher level of competition since we're kids. And so to be able to represent the United States at the Paralympics is a dream come true for me and really a culmination of many, many years of hard work in and out of the pool since I was a young child. But I think even more than that, I am so excited and just really can't wait to wear the American flag on my cap in races in Paris, wearing the American flag on my head in races, 
you know, to me stands as a thank you to the everyday American heroes all around me who have worked so hard this year to save me and are helping me rebuild my life. You know, my family, my friends, my doctors, nurses, the first responder, my physical therapist, my prosthetist, my coach, Jamie Barone, you know, my list goes on. But to me, the flag on my cap is a thank you to all of them and a reminder that our country is made up of people like them. Who is the Alley Truett beyond the water, beyond the pool? What, what are the things that bring you joy in life? Uh, I definitely love spending time with my friends and my family. And I think through this year, but always, I've been just so grateful for the support I have around me. And so in my free time, I love just being around my friends and laughing. And my family makes me laugh so hard. And something I've actually um, gotten really into I started a baking business in my recovery. And for me, baking, you know, one is very therapeutic because like swimming, it's the only thing I think about when I'm in the kitchen. I don't have to think about my doctor's appointments or different things that are weighing on me. Um, But two, early on served as a way for me to show myself that even when I was feeling down or feeling low, I had the power to make other people happy. And it seems a little silly through, you know, giving someone a cookie, but it was the message for me to keep going. Um, And so I found so much joy in the kitchen and my business, Truett's Treats, and I are having a blast just experimenting on different cakes and brownies and cookies. You were born and raised here in Connecticut. How will being a part of history representing the state of Connecticut in addition to the U.S., How does Connecticut play into your journey? Well, I am so proud to be representing Connecticut. Um, Connecticut is a sports loving state. You know, we have the UConn Husky men and women to be amazed by year after year. We have Yale Athletics, I have to shout out, of course, but we love sports here. And so growing up with Connecticut sports definitely just shaped my love of athletics. Um, And growing up on the Long Island Sound also shaped my love of swimming and of nature and I think that was just a gift that made me so grateful for my sport and for how beautiful Connecticut is. We are so proud that you will be representing the state of Connecticut and representing the United States. And I know, Allie, that there will be many people who will be watching you compete, who will be cheering you on. And I'm thinking of the young people who are dealing with all sorts of challenges in their own lives and sometimes may need a reminder that progress is possible, even if it takes longer than you expect. What would your message be to young people as they are watching the games and thinking about your own path? What's that message? Um, You know, I'm still learning myself in this first year of recovery, but I think probably three things I've learned that could be helpful to young people. Uh, I'd say first, don't count yourself out. No matter what you're going through, you're stronger than you think. And, you know, I've listened to David Goggins talk about this idea. He has this 40% rule where he says that, you know, we're all only typically operating at 40% of our capacity. And I heard that before the shark attack. And at that point, I truthfully thought maybe it was a little hyped up. But now life with a prosthetic has taught me what using more than 40% of my capabilities look like. You know, life with a prosthetic is hard and so hard on a daily basis. Um, And so I think learning that I have so much more to use and give within me has been really empowering. And my second learning uh, that's been really helpful for me is I would say find a way to make meaning of whatever hardship or tough time you're going through. It's not easy, but it really helps so much if you can allow the goal of of making meaning to be your guidepost. It will inform your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, your decisions. And I think it will ultimately point you in the direction of turning trauma or tough times into hope. And that's really what helps you get through nightmares. And so, you know, for me, becoming an amputee at 23 years old was a really hard pill to swallow, to say the least. Um... But trying to make meaning out of it and showing myself I'm stronger than I thought by making the Paralympics in just a year and by fighting to get my life back, by becoming an advocate and educating others about, you know, the community's needs and strengths and successes, and by starting a foundation, Stronger Than You Think, Inc., that will aim to help people who can't afford prosthetics and promote water safety awareness and support activities involving athletes with an impairment, it makes the whole thing less of a nightmare for me. And I would say, lastly, I've learned this past year, 
to really lean on friends and family. My community has been such a source of strength for me. And I'm someone who likes to typically keep my problems to myself because I aim to spread, you know, light and happiness and joy. And so it was a really tall order for me to let people into my low days and my tears. But I just sit here today so glad that I did because my community made all the difference in my recovery. And so one of my biggest learnings has been be as vulnerable as you can. Let people help lift you back up. They're there. They want to help. Um, let them. Ellie, we appreciate all the many ways that you are moving through pain to power and that you are encouraging and empowering others to pursue their purpose. And we can't wait to see you in competition. Allie Truitt is a Connecticut native and will be competing as a swimmer in the Paris 2024 Summer Paralympic Games. Thank you so much, Allie. Thank you. Coming up, we'll learn about the connection between the Olympics and geopolitics. And later, we'll meet one of the women competing in the first ever Olympic breaking competition. This is Disrupted. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. More than 200 countries or regions will be competing in the Olympics this year. But Russia and Belarus were barred from sending teams because of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Some athletes from those countries will be participating, but as, quote, individual neutral athletes. For more on that and other geopolitical issues surrounding this year's Olympics, we're joined now by Les Carpenter. He's Olympics writer for The Washington Post. Les, welcome to Disrupted. Well, thank you for having me. One of the things when we think about the Olympics is this opportunity to bring the world together, where we just focus on sport and the athletes And as you all know, it's never just been about the sport. It's never just been about athletes. And particularly now when we see so much global unrest, a lot of people are thinking about the Olympics and Russia and its invasion of Ukraine and some of the consequences of that. What does that war mean for who is eligible to compete in the Olympics this year? Yeah, it's one of those many tricky things that the Olympics uh, winds itself around uh, every time we have a games and political things come up. Uh, In this particular case, Russians and Belarusians will be allowed to compete, but only under the provision that they are not supporting the war, that they have not actively put things on social media saying they support the war, and that they are not somehow part of that country's military. Uh, And even then, their candidacy, if you want to call it that, their their case is taken up by a panel of three people the IOC has picked to go through every single one of these possibilities. And I think the interesting thing about it, and this is a very Olympic thing, one of those people is Pau Gasol, the uh, Hall of Fame basketball player. He used to play for the Lakers and obviously the star from Spain. So they've gone through, and I think the latest I saw was 34 Russians have been invited, and uh, I want to say about 20, 21 Belarusians. They have not all accepted. Uh, You'll see some tennis players you know, but it's not going to be a very large contingent. They will not be allowed to have Russia or Belarusian colors. They have this green flag that is very generic and bland, and that's what they will compete under. And if they win a medal, there will be no anthem played for them. It'll be as if they are just some odd entity that has shown up at the Olympics with no affiliation anywhere. I have a ton of questions about this because it seems straightforward that here's a committee (laughs) that decides, have you supported, have you actively advanced this cause? But what does it mean to support the war or support the invasion? What is this three-person committee exactly looking for? What's the metric that Paul Gasol is like, yes, you, not you. Help me out, Les. What are they looking at? (laughs) Well, you've just touched on what the whole Olympic world is about. One big question of, well, what is the murky answer to this? Um, I, I think it seems that they've done a pretty good job. For one thing, they have gone to Ukraine and asked, who would you approve? Who would you not? Give us reasons to say we can or cannot accept this person. So that helps a little bit. Uh, I think they do a lot of scouring of social media. There are a lot of Russians who train in the U.S. 
certainly tennis players and, and swimmers and whatnot, some of them are probably easier to, to kind of study and, and realize that they're living a very Western life and probably are incredibly attached from this. Uh, but it's murky. I, I And I suspect that somebody will show up and there will be an enormous question or something will be dug up out of their past and we'll be asking this very question. Well, what did this panel do? That That's the way it always works. You know, the other piece of it is, is what did this panel do in this case of Russian and Belarusian athletes? But maybe people are saying, well, this isn't the only country that is engaged in war or engaged in conflict. How does the IOC say we are going to focus on Russia, but not focus on perhaps what's happening in Kenya or what's happening with Israel? How does the IOC here's, say here's the country that we're focusing on at this point? Well, that's a fantastic question, uh, because I, I, I could even bring it to the United States uh, with the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, Iraq's invasion, while supported by much of the world, and I'm sure that that made it easier to for everyone to accept, is the fact is still you were trying to do a regime change hostily, uh, which is exactly what Russia is trying to do here. Uh, I, I think in a lot of cases it becomes a public relations thing. I think in some cases it becomes, well, what is palatable in the Western world in which the IOC lives? Uh, you mentioned Kenya. This is kind of invisible to a lot of people. Um, there's wars in the Americas that are invisible to a lot of people in Western world. This is a big one right in the middle of Europe where the IOC is based, where so much of the power of the Olympics has come from traditionally from the very beginning of the modern games in the, in the late 1800s. Yeah, I, I, it's it's very subjective. Les, would it be cynical for me to say some of this feels like posturing of wanting to be on a particular side in this global understanding? Or is it really about protecting the integrity of the sport and the games? Well, it's both. And that leads to bigger questions as well. I, again, I think the other issue at play here with Ukraine is that for the last, what, 38 years, 35 years, we've had a free Europe. Uh, and this is the first sort of incursion against that. Uh, and then Russia itself has been an enormous thorn in the side of the IOC now for a decade. Uh, it, 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 it isn't just Ukraine. If we go back to 2014, when Russia hosted the most expensive Olympics ever, we can get into kind of talking about the costs and and certainly regimes uh, that are totalitarian and how they can outspend other regimes or other countries. The most expensive Olympics in, 20, in 2014 also was the Olympics of the state-sponsored doping scandal, uh, where Russia was literally running fake tests through its own doping lab in its own Olympics. And so you have that. That's never properly been dispensed of. Russia is still technically under suspension from the World Anti-Doping Agency for its actions in 2014. It has not fully complied with all the, uh, you know, with, with all the with all the requirements of that. And you've had several Olympics in, in a row now where Russia has done something or has not technically been a full part of the Olympics. You also look at the fact that there's this document called the Olympic Truce, which doesn't have a whole lot of power. But it is a document that where the world's countries kind of promise not to attack another during a period right before the Olympics to the end of the Paralympics. Russia's three main attacks of other countries have all come in the middle of the Olympic truce. If you go back to 2008, this is under Putin, I mean, if you go back to 2008 in Georgia, if you go back to that was during the Beijing, right before the Beijing Olympics, the first Beijing Olympics, 2014 was Crimea. And uh, in the last uh, uh, Beijing Olympics in 2022, at the very end of the Olympic Games and before the Paralympics was uh, was Ukraine. So Russia has this long history of not playing by the rules, so to speak, or intentionally subverting them to advance their interests. So it becomes bigger than just the Olympics. I'm curious, however, Les, are there other historical precedents where you point to to say this sort of geopolitical challenge appears in the Olympics? Or is Russia really an outlier when we think about history? It's not totally an outlier, but there are not a lot in recent years. Uh, South Africa famously could not compete under apartheid uh, for a few years. 
Uh, there have been others in the past uh, that have kind of been lost to time. And then the Olympics, uh, let's see, there are five total Olympics between winter and summer games that were canceled uh, during World War I and World War II. Uh, so there have been several uh, where war or some kind of a political situation, a government situation, a policy has forced a country out. But what's going on now is a little uh, unique. The IOC is trying very hard to skate around Russia here to not completely anger Putin. But at the same time, well, let's see, you know, we, we don't want Russians here. Nobody wants Russians here. How do we do this? So this one is not very absolute. By the time this interview airs, the UK will have elected a new prime minister. By this time, France will have had the second or of two rounds of an election. And there's really the potential for there to be some major political changes and shifts happening in France. What impact do you think that will have as we think about the Olympics and the Paralympics in Paris? I've been thinking about that, especially the the, the situation in France. And uh, I think on the surface, it will be fine. I don't, I think uh, the people running it are not political. They are, and they're very, it is, they seem to be very efficient and very good, this, this group running the Paris Olympics. I assume it will chug along just fine. Paris is, of course, a, a city of protest. France is a country of protest. You have a socialist mayor and obviously an uh, enroaching far right in, uh, in, in the areas outside of the city or outside of the whole Paris region. Uh, so you could have some tension. But I think France lives under tension. I think Paris lives under tension. I don't know that that will be as big a deal. There are some interesting things, though, where the Olympics comes back in play. So in 2030... There will be another Olympics in France. And the IOC did this kind of, we can talk about this later as to how the IOC picks cities, uh, but it, it picked the south of France to host the Winter Games in 2030. There is a document that needs to be signed before the IOC meeting that will be right before this Olympics. That will be the Olympics where the IOC's members will officially approve the, uh, the south of France. There's two documents. One that will say... Yes, France will guarantee being able to pay the Olympics if something should fall apart with the organizing committee. The second is two regions there have to agree to share government, you know, control of the Olympics. They're very, very basic things. They have not been signed because they don't know the results of this election. The IOC will tell you this is nothing. It's just procedural. We just have to know who the next uh, you know, prime minister will be, blah, 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 blah. But it's sitting there unsigned right now. And I think this is the kind of tension that will sort of lurk over the Olympics with all that's going on in Europe right now. Little things like this, which seem like nothing, will start to become bigger and bigger and bigger things. There's a strong contingent of people who have been very critical of the IOC, whether it's the cities that it chooses to host an Olympics, whether it is the cost of hosting and some of the displacement that happens to people who are in a city when it is trying to uh, clean up its image for the world stage. How does that play into, given the instability that we're seeing across Europe, but particularly in France, how do those sorts of critiques play into the thing that you're mentioning here of, it sounds very basic, but we haven't yet gotten a signed agreement? There are, there's minimal building with this Olympics, which is cost saving and, and what the IOC is trying to do and what everyone's trying to do. The building that is being done is not being done in the city, but in the suburbs. And these are suburbs that Paris is kind of a place where your surrounding suburbs are loaded with a lot of immigrants, a lot of people without a great deal of money. Your underserved communities are your communities just outside of Paris. And there's a lot of talk about they're, they're building this magnificent athlete's village that will be turned into apartments. I've actually gone and looked at it and looked at the, the brochures for the apartments. They look fantastic. It's going to have all these Ironically, a big national police will be headquartered there as well. Um, but that's an area where people live and people have been displaced. And that's an area that will now become far more expensive. Is that attainable for some people in, in, in France? I feel that is some of the tension that is boiling around Paris. You certainly saw it last year with the, uh, with the, with the unrest after the police killing of a young man. I feel like some of the anger that spilled out of that had to have come from this inequity 
of the wealthy Paris and the not wealthy suburbs that now are being, quote unquote, gentrified. I want to make sure we talk about China here as well, <laughs> right? You, you can't talk about the Olympics. You can't talk about geopolitical challenges without thinking about China. We heard earlier this year that some of China's top swimmers tested positive for banned substances in the past. How do you think that scandal and many of the global concerns about China, how do you see that playing out in these Olympic Games? Yeah, I've wondered a lot about how the, the doping scandal will play out in these games. It will play out in swimming uh, because several of those swimmers will, will be back at this games again and they'll be competing against uh, other swimmers who have tested clean throughout their careers and will say, well, gosh, how come we've gone through these great efforts to make sure we're clean and here's this very odd, strange thing. And, and, I'll, and I'll just in a very brief, you know, briefly encapsulate it, but a group of Chinese swimmers, a large group, I think it was 23, right before the Tokyo Olympics, tested positive for the substance that's become very popular. It's a heart medication. It's a very random heart medication in Russia that is used for patients who are elderly and have heart issues. Uh, but suddenly is showing up in a lot of Russian athletes, The most famously the figure skater Camilla Valieva. It is also showing up in Chinese athletes. And 23 of them tested positive for this one substance and the explanation that the Chinese anti-doping authorities gave was, well, it was in this hotel where they all were staying for the swim meet, and it somehow got through the ventilation system. I, I Again, these are pills. I don't know how pills get chopped up and <laughs> spread through the ventilation system, but, you know, I, I you know, <laughs> it's one of those things that the, that, that can't, the, the agencies overseeing it can't properly investigate it, and it's become a scandal this way. Um I, I don't know if that will carry over as much. We'll certainly talk about it when the swimming is involved. I think the bigger issue of China is what are China's ambitions through sports? Uh, how has China used the Olympics for those ambitions? And the problem that has always been for the Olympics is that Russia and China can outspend everybody else. I, I, I mean, the two most expensive Olympics ever were the 2008 uh, games in Beijing and the uh, and the 2014 games in in Sochi. I mean, it was 50 million in in Sochi and and 44 million in Beijing, and no Olympics even approaches that. I think Paris will be about 10 million uh, or billion. Uh, sorry, billion. And that is that is something that's very hard for Western societies to try to match. And so it's it's a tricky dance. And I, you you take a Russia, you take a China. They use sport to promote their governments. They use sport to promote their regimes. Uh, you're seeing this now with India on the rise. You're gonna see Saudi Arabia try to get into the Olympics. You're gonna start seeing more places like that try. And that will be the interesting tension for the IOC. Can it continue to keep Olympics in places where there are quote unquote democracies, as opposed to trying to put Olympics in places with totalitarian regimes? I, For the next 10 years, we don't have to worry about it, but I think it, it could creep up. Here's my last question to you, Les. It's, it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit, and I know that you are as well, given where you are located. This is an election year in the United States. There's lots of angst about it, lots of uncertainty. Is there any significance for the United States and its election cycle as we think about the Olympic Games? It's interesting you say that because I've been thinking a lot about it. And I've been thinking a lot about it because I've thought a lot about 1984, which was the uh, Los Angeles Olympics. And if you remember, the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union and, and East Germany led a boycott of those games that then became an All-American Games. The U.S. just won medal after medal after medal after medal. That was the Ronald Reagan re-election year. And he probably would have won re-election anyway. But I think all that patriotic spillover further propelled him into office. I don't necessarily see that kind of spillover out of this Olympics into this election unless something external enters it, unless Russia invades France. I mean, I, I, I'm being preposterous here, but I'm just saying that I think you need something significant that would be out of the ordinary that we wouldn't even begin to, you know, begin to even possibly imagine for that to affect the election. I don't I don't see it being an impact. Uh, I always think it's interesting that you go one party's convention, the Olympics, immediately after the Olympics is the other party's convention. It usually is Republican, Olympics, Democrat, and it is this year. 
I, I think whatever happens at Democratic Convention will be unrelated. I think, I think there'll be enough excitement there without the Olympics to add to it. Les Carpenter is Olympics writer for The Washington Post. Les, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to reading everything you're going to write about this Olympics. Well, thank you. I, I do think it'll be an interesting Olympics, and I, I do think it will be one worth watching, and the, certainly the vistas of Paris will aid the... Uh, I, I, think, I think it will really be beautiful on television. Coming up, Team USA breaker Logan Edra opens up about her mental health journey. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we're talking about this summer's Olympic and Paralympic Games. This year's Olympics will feature a new sport called breaking. Breaking is a style of movement that developed out of hip hop culture in the Bronx. It can include a range of moves from spinning on the floor to elaborate footwork and freezes. You've probably heard the sport being called break dancing, but that term was popularized by the media, not by the people who comprise the breaking scene. So there's a debate over the use of break dancing with some considering the term derogatory. For the Olympics, the breaking competition will work like this. A DJ will choose the music, so breakers don't know what they will dance to beforehand. The breakers will then compete in one-on-one battles with the winner of each battle decided by a panel of judges. Logan Edra, also known as Logistics, is one of the four breakers representing Team USA. Logan's breaking journey started after her dad tricked her into going to a hip hop dance class. As Logan to tell me more about that experience. So I'll go back to when I started dancing. Uh, I was doing jazz, ballet, tap at a studio, and it got expensive. So um, fortunately, my dad brought me to a, a local church. Uh, I got a shout out New Hope Church in Chula Vista. <laughs> And um, they offered art classes, like music, dance. Uh, I, I was doing that for a while. And then my dad asked me if I wanted to try hip hop dance. And I said, no, <laughs> because I was too scared and shy and timid. And um, I was going to my art class and it ended up being uh, the hip hop dance class that he was talking about. And I told him, like, I didn't want to try this, but he was like, just just try it. If you don't like, you don't got to continue. But if you do then you can just keep going. And I tried it and I just fell in love instantly. Like it was literally one of the most amazing experiences I've had. And I just remember that moment so clearly because it I fell in love. Like I fell in love with dance at like seven. So after that, uh, I progressed really fast because I was just enjoying it so much. And then I, um, I went to Culture Shop Dance Center because they had more... Uh, advanced training and they had this breaking class and I remember seeing these kids just sitting on their heads and like trying some crazy moves and like doing some like weird dangerous stuff and and I told my parents like I want to try that <laughs> and it just intrigued me so uh, I got into it and then there was another class that was also breaking for kids and at the same studio and it was taught by a female and her name is Val Pal. and when I saw her um teaching this class, when I saw her breaking, I, it just changed my reality because I didn't, I thought it was a guy thing. I remember telling my, my, my dad, like, oh, I thought this was a guy thing. And then I saw her um, teaching that class and it was just, it made me want to do it even more. What have you learned about yourself in this journey of competitive breaking, excelling at this amazing sport and activity? What has it taught you about Logan? Excelling and breaking has taught me how strong I am. Um, when I'm in a cipher, like majority of the time, it's people, all different kinds of people from different backgrounds. And it's a very uh, aggressive, almost angry energy because that's what this dance is for. It's, it's a little bit of a angry dance not in a negative way but to like let it out so when i'm in the cypher um i just remember so many times being so scared to to get in the cypher but there was something that was keeping me there that was just like inviting but also intimidating at the same time so it taught me a lot about 
how strong I am and also taught me a lot about what I'm capable of and, and also the role that I have in this life and this world because it's not, I think um, as women, I, and I'm sure you know we're in a time where it's like a lot of women empowerment and some of it's performative, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, But for me, it's like, so if I look at it from like the big picture, which is very difficult to do when you're in the forest, but like to look at it from the outsider's point of view, then it, it makes me less surprised uh, if I'm making an impact on younger females and younger girls. Because, uh, for example, I just went to my, my, my um, I call them family, but my team, like in MIA, they're my crew. We threw a, a kids jam the other day. And I could just see all these kids and, and the impact I made on them. And it's it's a little bit, um, it just feels a little bit crazy, but it, I just, I can see the impact that I'm making on them. So it's just like, I know I'm doing something right. If, if, if there are people that are able to just cultivate more light within themselves by seeing what I'm doing, not even for my validation, but for them to see, yo, I can do that too. Like, and, and it's such a, it's it's like a, a selfless feeling like i don't know how to explain it so breaking taught me that as you describe that there was this lightness in your voice this energy that we could hear and i can see it on your face this connection of too often in our society i think young girls and young women are told not to be emotional are told not to express passion or anger and it's misdirected and to have a space of of competition where you can be yourself and also step outside of yourself for a moment to connect with your crew, to connect with the cipher, to connect with your own energy and to be able to live in that moment, there is this light that also gives other people the authority to pursue it in their way. How do you manage that, the energy of that, with the notion that, in fact, you are competing at the same time as you're expressing. How do you navigate those two things? You know, it's, that's that's a question that I ask myself every single day. <laughs> I'm like, how am I doing this? But I also, I think it's also because I know why I'm doing it. Um, I, I'm so in touch with my why that it drives me to continue with the work. And I love this dance so much that I can... I, I was going to say I could do it in my sleep, but I do do it in my sleep. I'm in my dreams breaking. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's hard to explain because I think majority of, of, I'm assuming that majority of the world may not be in touch with, um, this within them, this power that they have within them. Like everyone has this power to change the world, to make positive change. And then the awareness, I think it just comes from, being as present as I can in every interaction that I have. Like I'm such an empath that I, I absorb people's energies. And I, I think like I was so angry that I would feel everyone's emotions and feel, and I've dealt with narcissistic abuse. I've dealt with these things. So maybe it's, it's shaped my personality from a young age till now, but I decided to look at it as a gift instead of turning off the switch because I think it's very powerful. I think we can use our traumas as uh, to heal from that, to become stronger. And, and, um, it gives us gifts that we can offer to the world. So, um, going back to, I was talking about, oh yeah, absorbing people's energies. Um, I've, uh, I've been blessed to, um, have a curiosity for why I feel certain emotions. And I know everyone like feels these emotions, but I think, uh, it takes a certain type of person to, go deeper into that and do like the self work. And um, it is scary to talk about. It's very scary to talk about because I don't know how people are, um, how people receive this. You will be making history for the first time that breaking is a part of the Olympic games. You will be competing with team USA as one of the four breakers. You don't know this about me, but many, many years ago, I thought I wanted to be in breaking and had this little crew in my neighborhood. And I was absolutely awful, like awful at it. 
But it was this beautiful thing to come together. So now that I can look on my television and see you competing is that reminder of what's possible. But I have to ask you this question. What should I be looking for as we are watching you and other breakers competing and making history? What should the audience be looking for as they are watching this? Like, what does it, what does a competition look like at this level? Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure you weren't as bad as you're saying that you were because it's a dance. Um, but I, I, going back to the question, I think just people just need to enjoy what they're watching. I, I think, uh, with traditional sports, um, there's, it's like technical and like breaking is technical too, but we're a hybrid. Like we're this very different breed of, of, of athletes because we're, we're artists as well. So, um, we, yeah, I, I would say people, they don't gotta expect anything. They don't gotta look for anything. They just gotta sit back, relax and enjoy the show because it, it's like that's literally that's how easy easily digestible it is and that's why i think breaking is going to do so well because we don't got to ex over explain ourselves in terms of the physical form of what we do the proof is in what 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 we're doing and what we're sharing with our bodies and with our dance um so that's simply that just for the for the audience and the people out there that are hopefully watch breaking or fear not I think that's a big mistake. You gotta come and watch Breaking because it's gonna be the best. It's gonna be the most, the most. I'm just being biased because I love Breaking so much. I love the way that you say you are an athlete and you are an artist. My question to you, Logan, is: is what does this moment mean for you? This moment to do this thing that you love, that you excel at on an international stage. What is this moment for you? Yeah, this moment is actually for my dad. This moment is for my family. This moment is for uh anyone that loves me that couldn't do couldn't do this, you know, and it's it's actually very sad when I if I think if I think about at least <laughs> right now in this time of my life, it just I I know that my family and generations before me would have loved to to do something like this at this level, at this capacity. I think about the people in the Philippines, like from my, cause my grandparents were the ones who moved to the U.S. Just, I think about, I really think about them. I have this picture of my dad <laughs> that he didn't even send it to me. My dad, my, my grandma sent it to me. His mom sent it to me and I'm, uh, I'm grateful we still, we have a connection and it's a picture of him. Uh, in a b-boy stance with like a graffiti tagged up shirt and like a hat and like these sunglasses and it there was a moment and I where I realized I re I just felt like I, I'm doing this for you like I don't know like I just felt this like this feeling of like it was definitely gratitude and it was love and so that's what it means to me this is just it's for the culture it's for my family it is for myself, but it's for, for the message of love, light, truth, and, and God, ultimately. Well, Logan, I hope you know that you, just by being yourself, are empowering others. You are inspiring others. And we are looking forward to cheering for you very soon. Logan Edra, also known as Logistics, will be one of four breakers competing for Team USA in the 2024 Paris Olympics. Logan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Disrupted is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Wayne Edwards, Robin Doyan Aiken, Meg Dalton, and Katie Tularski. You can listen to all the previous episodes of Disrupted by finding us wherever you get your podcast. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening.